And I'm very excited to welcome our guests here today. This is really awesome. Um, quick intros. Uh, so we're chatting today about Nancy, which is WNYC Studios' LGBTQ-themed podcast uh, about how we define ourselves and the journey that we take to get there. And my guests are Tobin Lowe and Kathy Tu. And uh, prior to Nancy, Tobin was a producer. I'm going to just read this out so that you know I don't mess it up, because I will. Um, prior to Nancy, Tobin was a producer on WNYC Studios' More Perfect, which was a Radio Lab spin-off about the Supreme Court. Uh, his work has also appeared on Marketplace, Studio 360, and the Codebreaker podcast. He is the recipient of a 2015 STEM Story Grant from PRX and was a New Voices Scholar at the 2014 Third Coast Festival Conference. Tobin was once a professional cellist and attended a circus camp as a child. Fun fact. Yeah. All true. All true. Um, <laughs> Kathy heads up Nancy's West Coast Operations, AKA her home in Los Angeles. Prior to Nancy, Kathy did production work for a number of podcasts, including The Memory Palace, The Mortified Podcast, and Masterpiece Studio. And she would like it to be noted that this whole hosting thing makes her very uncomfortable, but she's leaning the F in. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being here. This is really wonderful. I know we have some fans of the podcast in the audience. Yes? Thank yes. You. Great. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in with a few questions. I'm curious, what precipitated the creation of Nancy the podcast? Where do you want to start? Um, <laughs> I'm not just pandering here. It started with a Google Doc. It did. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> so Kathy and I met, I guess, three years ago at this point Yeah. Um, at, a, at a program called the Transom Story Workshop. It's like a boot camp for people wanting to get into public radio. Four years ago. Four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we just like immediately latched onto each other and were like, we need to work together somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and it came up that like, we loved this sort of like This American Life Radio Lab style of radio storytelling, but we didn't really see a program that was applying that to queer stories, like to LGBT stories. Right. So we were like, we should just make that. Mm -hmm. We should like figure out a way to do that. And at the time, we were just going to do it on our own. We were going to like freelance yeah, it. On, our si on the side. Right. Um, and we did what we always did when we were like, procrastinating on a thing, which is like you start a shared Google Doc, and that makes you feel like you're getting the ball rolling, like we're being productive. <laughs> it's happening. Let's write some words. <laughs> <laughs> I see you updating. I'm updating. <laughs> Magic is happening. Um, and then it just so happened that like maybe two weeks after we decided we were going to do this on our own, WNYC opened up like an open call for uh, podcast ideas. Mm -hmm. So we ended up pitching to them in like a Shark Tank style. Like, we had five minutes on a stage at a journalism conference to pitch them our idea. Yeah. And there was a clock that was counting down Right. our five minutes. Yeah. It was terrifying. I blacked out for the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, so out of that, we ended up winning, and we got a pilot with WNYC, and we developed it with them for about a year or like a couple months. Mm -hmm. And then we got greenlit out of that, and that Here is Nancy. Here we are. Amazing. That sounds like an intense start to a podcast. Um, uh, so what are your goals for the podcast overall? Do you have particular goals in mind for putting this out into the world? Mm. I feel like I always say my goal for the podcast is for people to feel, especially people in the LGBT community, to feel like they're connected to something. They hear different voices, and they're not stuck in their corner of whichever part of the community that they're in. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talked a lot about, like, moments where people see something or read something where they feel really seen or recognized. Um, and so like, in a lot of ways, the podcast has a very simple thought behind it, which is like, as many people as we can, like, if we can give them that moment, that would be really great. Yeah. And you said something recently uh, about the podcast. You said that you wanted it to be the defender of queer joy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. I think that that is kind of what we're aiming for. Um, so, how do you decide which topics to cover? There's so many topics to cover. So many topics. To cover. So many. And you've already covered quite a few. 
Um, it's a balancing act of uh, what stories get pitched to us, what stories we find interesting, what stories are happening right now, uh, the opportunities we have to capture somebody trying to figure out a thing, which we love to do. Um, it's a giant balancing act. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of stuff that we want to cover that's sort of on this mental list that we keep going of mm -hmm. like, we really want to cover this and this and this. But we also made like a hard rule for ourselves that like nobody on the show would ever just be coming on to like define themselves. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like we we try really hard not to have anyone on who's just like, this is who I am and I'm defining my identity for like a larger audience. <laughs> so a lot of times it's like waiting for the right story or the right interview that will get at things in an interesting way. And so sometimes like that's the bar for yeah. something getting on the show. Yeah. And do you feel like that is what makes like what what do you feel makes Nancy unique? Because there are obviously other LGBTQ focused mm -hmm. podcasts, but there is clearly a unique angle. What do you feel that that is? I think it's that I, I think we both love narrative stories. Um, I don't know more than interviews, but there, there are times when I just want to listen to um, a narrative story just because I don't have to think too much about it, if that makes sense. Like sometimes I listen to an interview that does like a really deep dive into something and that's fascinating. Um, but that gets me a little bit tired at the end. And sometimes it's sort of like, I don't know, watching good television, you just sort of sit and you let them like entertain you. And that's what I like about narrative driven stories. Um, the fact that we can tell a story featuring queer people living their lives or whatever they're going through. And I can sit back and just sort of like let it entertain me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did I answer a question? Is that yeah. the, okay. <laughs> uh, but you also, aside from having folks come on and um, talk during your show or be interviewed, you also share a fair number of personal stories and anecdotes on the show. Mm -hmm. What is your process for deciding how and when you share that personal information? You have a wide audience. Um, hmm. If my therapist tells me that it's interesting, I literally just had my therapist pitch me on the thing. <laughs> it was very bizarre. I was like, I don't want to talk about that, or like, I don't know what to talk about on the show. And she was like, I can think of five things you should talk about. <laughs> uh, no, it's like, well, so like when we first started the show um, and we were like working on our pilot, Kathy had been sitting on this amazing tape where she came out to her mom um, again. again. Like, and it was this like really amazing tape of like the experience of coming out specifically to an immigrant mother and like how are you dealing with both translation in a literal sense but also in the divide of like what her experience is versus your experience. So like we, we even when we didn't know what the show was, we knew that that was great tape. Like we knew that that was a great story. So I feel like a lot of us digging into personal stuff has tumbled out of Kathy's first story being like really personal and people really responding to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we have cursed ourselves forevermore. I know. To be spilling things out on the Every show. Every time I feel anxious about something, I feel like our boss is like, maybe do a story on that. I'm like, yeah. Oh, damn it. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> so you have um, started season two. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Um, how do you feel you shaped season two um, differently from how you shaped season one? Or did oh. you shape it differently? Or is it more of a continuation of the same? I feel like it's a continuation yeah. because we always knew that we had sort of like 12 episodes in season one. And we were very aware that you're not going to get to 12 episodes and be like, we did it. <laughs> like we covered all the stories <laughs> all that there are told. to do. <laughs> so yeah, it feels like we like season two was just an opportunity to do more of the storytelling that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I will say the difference is that like we have an audience base and we want to start figuring out how we interact with that audience. Mm -hmm. And so like that was the that was the drive behind this project we're doing called Out at Work. Which is like that was going to be my next question. Oh, cool. <laughs> Tobin's actually a mind reader. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Another fun fact. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, out at work is this big project we're doing that has to do with some of the big legal stuff about like what protections we do and don't have as LGBT workers in this country, but it also sort of boils down to like the everyday stories of like, are you your your coworker's token gay friend, and do they ask you about like we just had a guy 
on this week's episode who talks about like because he's out at work everyone assumes that he just wants to talk about sex all the time and they're like coming to him with all their sex stories and he's like I just want this to be my job <laughs> <laughs> but that you know there's like there's real stories like that just interacting with coworkers and that kind of thing and I think we're really interested in having you know listeners of the show share their stories with us and sort of get into how that's like really fascinating story territory for us. So yeah. Yeah, so this is um, obviously an area that is of interest, I think. I mean, the entire podcast is, is of interest to this community, but the out of work piece, um, for many of us who were out, some of us very, very out, <laughs> super out. Um, I think that these are really relevant and timely stories to be telling. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about what precipitated the project and like how you're thinking about it now that you're starting to dive in? Yeah. Do you want me to do it? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, truthfully, part of it was inspired by, I don't know if anyone listens to Death, Sex, and Money. It's another podcast. So they just did a big project where they asked people about their student loans. And they got an incredible outpouring of people just being like, here's a thing that I experience in my life all the time, like having to deal with student loans. But it's like, I have to deal with it by myself. It's a thing that touches a lot of us, but that we don't talk about that much. Um, and so like part of it was thinking about like, OK, we have a very engaged LGBT audience. What's a thing that affects a lot of them, but we don't necessarily make the time to talk about or dig into? Um, and pretty immediately, like we started joking, like, our jobs are bizarre because like being gay is like we are professional gays. <laughs> like it's in the title of what we do. Yeah. But that like for most people it's not that way. And most people have to navigate being queer at work and how much they share and how much mm -hmm. they don't share. And that that can be a complicated thing and a funny thing and a, a awkward thing. Um, and anytime there's like a lot of emotions and stuff, we're like, there's probably stories there. <laughs> and we should talk about them. Um, and this is probably a good moment to plug that you guys should go to nancypodcast.org slash work and fill out our survey and share stories if you have them. Because mm -hmm. we are actively mining for them now to possibly put them on the show. Yeah. And our producer, Matt, will call you and record you at some point. <laughs> probably. I don't know. Oh, this is a good moment to say. Matt, our producer, wanted me to say a thing, and I don't know what these words mean, but he wants you to bring back Google Reader. <laughs> oh, yes. I also agree. Can we talk about this? Why did it go away? Ra raise your hand if you can do something about Google Reader. <laughs> no. There's no. Nothing, okay. nothing has replaced it. I've tried them all. OK, sorry. <laughs> No, ex Google Reader staff in here. No, no, I'm sorry. We have Was it very like sadly a, struck out. It's like a book thing. No, it allowed you to like subscribe to different blogs and like news and stuff, and then it just like all shows up in front on your page, and then you can just like mark the ones you've read. It was so great. I don't need that. It was the great, greatest thing. <laughs> it's fine. Now they just spam you with all these emails. I take it back. You can leave it. <laughs> now we're all listening to podcasts. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to I wanted to talk about representation quickly um, and how you go through the process, particularly with the folks that you choose to bring on the show. And I know that there was a discussion, um, which I won't dive too deeply in case anybody hasn't heard the discussion yet, but there's conversations about the responses that you've received from fans about bi representation or other um, other pieces of the LGBTQQIAAPP acronym that are, are not represented. So I'm curious how you're approaching how you're approaching that. Again, is a huge balancing act between, we don't just think about that, we also think about uh, race and location and socioeconomic status. There's a lot of um, things we try to pack, well not pack, but like we try to spread out our stories as much as we can. Um, but I feel like a lot of times we get pitched stories from the coasts and it's hard to wade through those to find other stories from the Midwest, from the South. Um, just to get more diverse voices onto the show. And I think that's one of the reasons why, why we're doing the Out at Work, because Out at Work projects so that we can get more people, more voices onto the podcast. Yeah. It, it is, it's a challenge, though, because 
inherently, we did set a very wide net for what we said the show would be about. And so that covers a lot of people who have been waiting for their story to be told anywhere. Mm. You know what I mean? And so like, when somebody comes at you and says, I'm a fan of the show, please do a story about you know, X, Y, or Z, like, you have to take that in, because that is somebody who is waiting for their story to be told, and that is something that we are endeavoring to do. So there is this relationship with an audience where you have to take in that kind of criticism and be like, yep, you are right. We are going to do our best, and we are going to like try mm -hmm. and find a way to do that in a smart way that serves the story well. So yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, speaking of fans mm -hmm. and your audience, um, what were, which episodes, since you are having this sort of back and forth with your audience and they're sending you letters and giving you feedback, um, which episodes elicited the strongest responses? <laughs> Harry and did Potter. Those, did those surprise you? <laughs> Harry, Harry Potter. Potter, okay. By far. <laughs> By Harry far. Potter. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well. Well, so our producer Matt's a giant Harry Potter fan, and he also loves going down the rabbit hole of like nerd raging. And the thing that he enjoys nerd raging about is the fact that Dumbledore is not actually gay. You can't just after the fact say that he's gay. And so he did an episode about this, and people were just upset about it. They were pissed. They were mad. They were tagging they were so J.K. Rowling, mad. and we're like. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny, too, because like either one or two episodes before it, I think before it, we had done an episode about gay Republicans, which we were expecting that one to be very controversial. And it, and it was to a certain degree. Like mm -hmm. We did get some pushback and some tweets and stuff. But then Harry Potter came out and just blew it out of the water. <laughs> like People were furious. Yeah, they were like, how dare you? How dare you question Dumbledore's yeah. How dare you question or? rolling, I think, yeah. is what well, it was. <laughs> so I think if you actually listen to the episode, it's like a tongue-in-cheek but also interesting conversation about representation and what does it actually yeah. mean to tell someone's story and not just do like the lip service of like, by the way, this person's queer. We yeah. did it. We told a queer story. Yeah. So, I, I think that that's what the episode was about, but there were a lot of people who saw a headline and we're like, oh, you are calling out J.K. Rowling. I'm going to tweet at her and see if we can get this going online. Yeah. yeah. Get this going, meaning like start Meaning like have a fight her yell with... at us. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Actually, that would have been great if she had done that, but she didn't. <laughs> that, OK. Were there any other, so you said the Harry Potter episode as well as the, I'm, I'm assuming they were the log cabin Republicans? Yeah. OK, so um, were there any other episodes that, that elicited surprising responses, either positive or negative? Surprising responses. I guess I wasn't surprised by this, but when I announced that I was watching the L Word, people like, I don't know, they, like, they freaked out. For, I don't know why. <laughs> because I'd never seen it? I don't know. Well, I think that was one of the episodes where we were like, this is going to be a niche episode. Like, oh, yeah. this will, some people will stand really hard for this, and other people will skip it. But like the passion that came out, like people have a lot of feelings about the L word. They do. So I many feelings. No I have so many feelings. <laughs> I really did. I know. Wait, so who has watched the L word? Anyone? A couple people. She loves she Jenny. <laughs> she is Team Jenny. I'm sorry, you need to get out. No. And the la yeah, the last panel we were on, this came up, and it ended up like. We didn't talk about anything else for 20 minutes because people were so mad that she liked Jenny. Usually there's one Jenny supporter in the audience. How far through the series are you? <laughs> I, I just watched the whole it. thing. I finished it, and I decided at the end that Team Jenny. Yeah. <sighs> I know. OK. Wait, are there any I Buffy watchers in the audience? Oh, Buffy, gonna go this there? OK. OK. She also loves Faith, which is. Thank you. No. Thank you. I think that is insane. He doesn't count the angel arc, which like is like what? It's the same Buffy. There verse. have to be rules. There, there have to be rules. Faith all the way. You like Faith, and that is nuts. <laughs> I also like Willow, but who doesn't? Yeah. Who doesn't? It's like saying I like bread. <laughs> what kind of bread? <laughs> Oprah bread. Mm. Bread. OK. Um, all right. So, so the L word, Harry Potter, 
Um, these are all pretty juicy topics yeah. um, that could fill many, many hours. But you have to cut them down to 20 to 25 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, are there any topics, I mean, I feel like if you can fit the L word in Harry Potter into 20 to 25 minutes, you're superhuman and probably fit anything <laughs> into 20 to 25 minutes. But are there any topics that you did not feel you could cover in that short of a time? Oh. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I would say if there are, we're probably still trying to find a way to do it. Yeah. And probably shouldn't say any more. Oh, OK. <laughs> I would no, I don't say know. like things that require like deep investigative journalism. I don't think we have the capacity yet to do it, but maybe one day in the future. Yeah, we're still figuring that part yeah. out, I think. Awesome. Um, so for the pieces of pop culture that you dive into, um, do you feel as though these require careful consideration, the pieces of pop culture. I was uh, looking here, we've got the Golden Girls. <laughs> um, again, Harry Potter comes up pretty strongly. How do you tell stories about pop culture? Because often I think that we find that um, pop culture has a particular, a, a particular heteronormative skew. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you feel you address some of, well, heteronormative and many other normative very normative skew. Mm -hmm. So how do you address issues of pop culture? And do you find yourselves conflicted in addressing some of those things? I feel like I'm conflicted all the time, especially working on these stories. Um, well, things like the Golden Girls, I, for pop culture stories, I think we try to, f try to find an angle that hasn't really been, um, I don't know, like seen before. Like for Golden Girls, we were looking at the, what did you call it, like the, the fandom around it, mm -hmm. and how, what, that, what that meant to people who are queer, even though the show wasn't explicitly queer. And we found different stories about how the show itself had affected us, instead of doing a deep dive into making that show and the actors and whether or not they liked each other, and even though I know all of those stories too, but we couldn't talk about those stories because they weren't relevant. So, yeah, so I, I feel like we try to find an angle that hasn't really been covered before. Yeah. You agree? Yeah, well, I think there's like, it's funny, like I think pop culture, like any of the stories we do, we made a very conscious decision early on that like no one on the show would come on as a quote unquote expert of anything. That they would always be coming from the angle of like, this is my personal relationship to this thing. So like I think when we were developing like the Golden Girls episode or the L Word episode, there were moments where those stories took the shape of like here is a like a high level look at what this show meant, and then that felt like like kind of what you were saying like it was trying to do too much, and so when we buried down and it was like oh this episode is actually more about what people do with fandom or like what people do with something that's not explicitly queer, but they reinvent it for themselves or mm -hmm. see it through a different angle and like find that representation. Like that's the moment where the, the pop culture episodes sort of click for us when there's like, it's about something else, mm -hmm. not just the show, if that makes sense. Um, does anybody have questions? Does anybody want to pop up to the mic quickly and ask some questions of your own? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Kind of in the vein of the Out at Work project, um, we talked a lot about your sort of audience response. I'd be curious what the professional response has been, I'd say both from maybe like other podcasters and maybe like folks at WMYC, et cetera. Meaning like how have they taken to the project? How have they taken to the, to, uh, sorry, um, how have they taken to the podcast as a whole sort mm -hmm. of, um, you know, sort of, yeah, I guess in general. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, WNIC has been super supportive, and I feel like um, we're super, we're very lucky to be, to have been able to pilot this project with them because they let us take a while to really figure out what our sound was before we released it into the wild. And ever since it's been out, I've heard nothing but good things from our coworkers. <laughs> Maybe they're just being nice, I don't know. I mean, public radio, admittedly, is a very crunchy space. <laughs> so there is like sort of that support in there, and like a genuine curiosity for people to have their own space to talk about identity and um, stuff that like traditionally in larger media doesn't get talked about or covered very much. So 
I feel like WNYC Studios has been super supportive of us and like what we're trying to do. And like super supportive also of the fact that we were like, we have a very specific audience that we're targeting. Mm -hmm. Like we're not that interested in like broadening this out into like Yeah. I mean we're not very interested in targeting this, like, here's how we explain queer culture to a larger audience. Like, they were on board with us being like, we are really interested in targeting specifically a queer audience. And in the specificity of that storytelling, other people will show up too, because they will feel like they are getting let into a world that maybe they don't know about and are curious about. So that kind of support has been Really awesome. The other thing I'll say, which we were just realizing, is like it's kind of hard to troll a podcast. I know. So like, yeah, somebody who wants to uh, who disagrees with your content or doesn't like queer people, let's say, to troll a podcast, they would have to actually listen one and then find the quote they don't like and then tweet us, and then like so the times that that has happened is lesser than yeah. people like just sort of expressing fandom. So. Yeah. In that sense, like I think WNYC recognizes that podcasting is a great, can be a great space for like people to really, you know, like express exactly what they want to talk about. Yeah. Of course, now we say we say that, and the trolls will actually. Listen. I know. I just invited the trolls. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but if we do get like negative messages, it's always reacting to some headline. Nobody's actually heard it. <laughs> Have you had experiences of people the? very few who have trolled you actually listening to the podcast and having their minds changed. It sounded like the people who were trolling you had not, were pretty clear that they had not listened. Um. Oh, minds changed. Well, I will say like we got an email very early on that the person just sort of declared up top like, I'm a 55 year old white cis male and I love your show. And it helps me like learn about, you know, X, yeah. Y, and Z. And the, our reaction was kind of like, hmm, we were not expecting you, sir, but welcome. <laughs> welcome, yeah. Yeah, you get a few of those. Have one more? Yeah. Um, apologies if you already answered this at the very beginning of the talk, um, but just wondering, how did you guys decide on the name Nancy for the podcast? Oh, good, good story. Pure frustration. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we, had, we originally pitched the idea as Gadio, um, and then decided that, well, number one, it was taken. That. But <laughs> also, we wanted the, our, our title to be a little bit more inclusive on the surface. So, because if it was just Gadio, I think we didn't want to um, alienate anybody that doesn't respond to just gay. So, then we went through a bunch of different puns, all the queer puns, none of them were right. And then Tobin one day was like, we're just going to name it after a person. Right. There was a moment where, like, where for a second it seemed like a good idea to name the show Gay Ponies. Yeah, that and was so great. we like walked around for a, a day being like, Gay Ponies, right? This is good? Yes? <laughs> no? OK. And then, and then we were like, and, th and then truly in a moment of frustration, I was like, let's just give it a human name. And then we landed on this idea that Nancy um, has like a nod to queer culture. It has this history as being a term, like a very old school term for a gay man, and that so we liked that it had this almost like friend of Dorothy nod, like if you know, you know, kind of thing. And then we also liked that there was a bit of reclaiming, because I think Nancy historically has been sort of a negative term. And so we liked that we were going to take it and reclaim it and define it as something new and fun and joyous. Mm -hmm. So like, and then there was just something irreverent about naming a, a fucking show about, after a person, you know, like <laughs> Nancy. It was like kind of ridiculous. So yeah. it ticked a lot of boxes for us, and we thought yeah. it was fun. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't on board initially, but I trusted you. <laughs> I trusted you. Jenny's um, fine. So we, we touched on this a little bit, uh, and I think one of the things I really appreciate about the podcast, and what sets it apart for, from something like This American Life, is the personal disclosure piece, hmm. um, and a lot of the, the things that you've unpacked for the world to hear. Where would you say you've experienced the most personal growth as a result of that uh, since the time you started? Yeah. Well, I feel like that's directed at me, because I figured a lot of stuff out via podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of you. I just listened to the, uh, like the pool party bathing suit episode. Yeah. There's a yeah, of... there's a lot of stuff. Um, I didn't really like engage with queer media before this podcast started. And as soon as um, Tobin and I started working on this, I was like, oh my god, I'm so behind. 
um, and I did like a deep dive into it. Uh, but along the way, I feel like I'm through the podcast. I, I would say I'm coming into who I who I think how I identify and how I'm presenting to the world, and that's been like super beneficial. I was driving with Tobin in LA when we were on vacation together, <laughs> and um, I told him that I don't think I would be where I am now had this project not come to be because I've worked through a lot of stuff, like coming out to my, my mom, um, cutting my hair, being OK with the fact that I feel a stigma towards a certain word that I now don't really anymore, which has been like a, a, a big step for me. And then going to an all queer space that originally I was very scared to be in because there's too many queer people. How do I even negotiate that? And now I love it. I'm going back to A camp next year. Next year. <laughs> um, so it's been a huge. Do you feel like I'm growing? Do you oh, think yeah. I'm growing? Okay, yeah. great. Every single day. <laughs> he does learn a new thing about me every day. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's what the podcast has done for me. Yeah. Eternally grateful, Tobin. <laughs> Eternally that's grateful. Good. Yeah. What about you? Have you changed? Uh, yeah. Well, I. So for me, I think the challenge for me has been that. I came from a radio background where I had been used to being in more of a reporter seat. So like for Marketplace or More Perfect, like it was a very like sort of like the story is out here and I'm working on it from a distance. Um, and so like the, the piece of the show where like we are now sort of diving into our personal lives and having to navigate doing stories about that is new, very new territory for me and something that like I have been reluctant to do but that I think Kathy has really set a tone just for. Just like, dive to, right <laughs> in there. But like how to do it in a smart way where it's not just like, here's all of my junk, but also like, here is my junk and what I learned from it and what you can hopefully like take a piece of also. So I think in that way, like I have learned from Kathy because she sort of like set a tone for that and, and how to do that. Um, still figuring it out, still yeah. talking to my therapist about it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Michelle. <laughs> if she ever watches this. You know, she that was will. like your hi, mom. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so do we have another question coming up? Yeah? All right, cool. I also just love that this group is called Gigglers. I know. Is there like, I was pitching bad puns before this, so like, is the Swedish Googlers called Googlers? <laughs> He's got more, you guys. Women, women who date younger men are their Googlers? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Feel free to take any of these, by the way. I had another one that was really good. Oh, I was like our Halloween enthusiast googly eyes. I love all of these. Okay. I'm so glad we're recording this so that we can have this for posterity. Take them all. Take them all. Um, I'm a big Harry Potter fan, mm -hmm. so definitely had reactions to that one. Um, so the way I react to a lot of the heteronormative like books and series is fan fiction. Mm. There's like big Harry Potter and other series like fan fiction to make it queer. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you had any reactions to that with people being like, OK, but some person's random like idea explains why maybe Dumbledore is gay, and, like gives them a background and like talks more about his relationship. Also, Harry Potter and Voldemort being in love fan fiction is just like amazing. Look is that it. true? Huh? I didn't know that existed. There's like lots of stories about Harry Potter wow. and Voldemort being in love and how they take over the world together. Recently, I've been down the rabbit hole about Ron Bledore. How Ron is actually Dumbledore. He goes yes. back in time <laughs> and becomes Dumbledore. <laughs> I wish Matt was here. He would really be into this. He would love this. <laughs> I, I will say, I think when Matt was working on that story, he did have a part of it talking, like more explicitly talking about the, like, the really rich fan fiction world that has like, mm -hmm. claimed Harry Potter. And then I think it's like what we were talking about before, like, that, that felt like it could deserve its own story. And so to like, give it an almost perfunctory nod in this thing that was sort of about just the books, I think we felt like, oh, this is a thing we should return to and dive into like, as its own thing, because it's such an interesting yeah. world, yeah. like what people do with fan fiction. Yeah. So yeah, you should definitely direct us to what we should be reading. Yeah. I'll send you some. Yeah, yeah please yeah. do. You know Matt, he would love it. Jan, do you have a question? Nice. Uh, hi, Tobin. Hi, stranger. <laughs> Um, so I know you from a pretty different background as a classical cellist, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm curious um, sort of about 
your experience growing up, I think, thinking that that was going to be your, your life path and, and the transition that you made there? Yeah. Wait, hold on, first question. Do you have a good Tobin story from his cellist <laughs> days? I mean, his cellist days are long and varied, so yeah, we have plenty of stories for them. <laughs> Jen and I used to like play together. She's an incredible violist. Does, any, does everyone know that? She's like such a good violist. Um, and also like annoyingly somebody who's very good at both things. Like oh. you're, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jen is annoyingly good at a lot of stuff, yeah, 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 actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so I, I started as a cellist and like did that for a long time. Um, and then had the thing that I think like a lot of our musician friends have, which is that like the training is very different than the actual life, like the living of being a musician. Um, and so at a certain point, I had been like gigging and doing orchestra gigs and that kind of thing. And, and just sort of like had enough awareness to be like, I don't think this is gonna sustain me for, for the rest of my life. Um, and then the cool thing about Radio is it's kind of an island of lost toys. Like there's a lot of people who started in one thing and sort of found their way into radio. Um, and I think what made the transition easier for me is that I feel like radio exercises a lot of the parts of my brain that I used as a cellist. So like you're not just telling somebody's story, but you are telling it almost musically. Like you have to have a sense of pacing and dynamics and um, sometimes literally working with music. And so radio kind of felt like a, it felt somehow like a related jump-ish to, to like feed this intellectual part of myself that I, that I wanted to take advantage of and then also still use the musical part of my brain. That, that being said, I was very aware that I was jumping from a niche thing that I probably wasn't gonna make much money in to another niche thing that I probably wasn't going to make much money in. So there was a moment, there were definitely moments in there where I was like, this is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever done. But it worked out OK. But Kathy also. Same thing. Were, yeah. I was in another career, and then I quit it, and then we became friends. <laughs> Are you OK with sharing what the career was? Oh, before? yeah. I went to law school, and then I graduated. And then I was like, don't really want to practice law. And then I decided to go to Transom, the boot camp where Tobin and I met. Um, but it's sort of similar in that I've always enjoyed detailed things, and so law was great for that. And now the way Tobin and I work together, he's such a big picture guy about structure and how a story should um, fit together. And I'm more about the intimate details of like when a piece of music should start, should it move over just a microsecond, or whether the the whether the, this cut works because it doesn't sound natural to my ear. Um, and we tend to we fit together. Like a puzzle piece. <laughs> I'm curious for a lot of us who are exploring what it is like to be, um, and this probably harkens back a little bit to the Out at Work project, mm -hmm. but are sort of exploring what it's like to be um, out in one way or another uh, in the workplace. And I think that we're very lucky in many ways here at Google in comparison particularly to some of the places that I've been um, where I was not really not able to be out that we have a pretty supportive uh, company and a supportive community here. But I'm interested to know um, if you came into any sort of like personal conflicts or challenges with, with moving into the space of being sort of professionally out. Um, was that scary? Was that, um, were you worried about putting yourselves into this sort of semi very public space and any backlash that you might get? I mean, I was nervous about being a semi-public person, but that's just a personal anxiety thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like, I'm a privacy nut, so <laughs> that was weird. Did you have any? Yeah, well, I think one thing we both talked about is that we, I don't think we ever wanted to go into this suddenly becoming like the voice of the gays. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or like the queer voice, so like, I think there was a moment where we were like, oh, if we do this show and we don't do it the right way, it's going to come off as if we think we know everything, or like mm -hmm. as if anyone who's on the show is an expert somehow. And that, and I think one of the blessings of like being able to do stories is that from the jump, you're starting from like this is this person's personal experience. They're speaking from what they know, and sort of like telling their piece of it. 
And so like once we sort of figured out like, oh, as hosts, we can do that also. We can say like, we don't know all the answers. Part of the show is like trying to figure out some answers or like figure out a piece of an answer. Um, I think that was an immediate, but there, there was a lot of fear at the beginning of like ever being booked on a like CNN news show as a talking head and like this queer thing happened. What do what do the queers think? <laughs> Thoughts. Tobin and Kathy tell us what all of you think. Well. <laughs> Um, and that's like very much a thing we like immediately moved away from. Yeah, yeah, no. The other thing is that now my mom sends me every article she reads that has a remotely queer thing in it. So hmm. it's like such and such gay person did this. On the flip Here's side, the my mom thinks I'm doing an internship in New York because she doesn't understand radio and she's like devastated about this law thing. <laughs> <laughs> very devastated. <laughs> Every conversation is like, when are you going to take the bar exam? <laughs> Eventually, I will. <laughs> so, oh, no, she still thinks you're going to take the bar exam? I promised her I would at some point. Oh, Sometimes you're like, I should just take it to a piece or I'm like, that is insane. <laughs> <laughs> do you, on that note, do you feel comfortable, and you can certainly say no, um, sharing your stories about coming out to your parents and what that was like? Do you want to share your story? Sure. Um, I came out to my parents. This, this is covered a little bit in our first episode. It, it's covered a lot of bit in our first episode. But if you haven't heard, I, um, I came out to my parents Thanksgiving year of my freshman year of Thanksgiving break of my freshman year of college. Um, and my mom's reaction was basically like, well, as long as we're sharing, I think you've gained weight. <laughs> was like Your mom's the reaction best. number one. Damn, mom. Yeah. Yeah, she immediately went back to the truth bombs. Yeah, she's still dropping them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was her. And then my dad, we had this funny thing where he, at the time, was obsessed with Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, <laughs> which I had very complicated feelings about. Like I, kinda, I, like, I didn't really see myself in that show, and I didn't really feel like it helped me figure out myself. But for my dad, it was this thing where like, that same year, he had seen Brokeback Mountain. And, and I had asked him to see it. And his reaction was like, why did you ask me to see that? It's like a story about sort of how that can be hard and ultimately deadly for some people to come out. Um, and so it was this weird thing where his fandom of Queer Eye actually helped him a lot, because it helped him imagine that I could be a happy adult person who is like leading a full life. Even though those guys were like literally redecorate your apartment and then leave. <laughs> Did you call them literal fairies? <laughs> yeah, there was like an aspect where like, yeah, you don't have to engage in their rights, just like let them paint your walls. <laughs> Get out of there. I'll leave. So anyway, so we had this funny thing where like I hated the show, he loved the show, but it became like a translation tool for, for us. So that yeah. was that was kind of my coming out thing. I think I had a more classic coming out of I came out to my mom, my parents, both of them, and then uh, my mom screamed at me over the phone. And then I tried it again later, and she didn't talk to me at all about it. And then I went to Burning Man. <laughs> and I had a moment at the temple in which I was like, got to do this again. Um, so then I came out again to my mom, and I brought. At the time, I thought it was a translation issue. I thought, like, if she understood what I was actually saying, then she wouldn't feel the way that she does, which was completely wrong. She absolutely feels, she understood the whole time. <laughs> and she was not OK with it. And we had this conversation, and I recorded it, because I felt like every time we talked about it, it just went away, and it just wasn't going to be around. And I wanted to acknowledge that I had come out to her. Um, so to me, I didn't, I didn't want to feel insane. So recorded it, and then it became the basis of our first episode. So really, the podcast came around because of Burning Man. Oh, God. <laughs> if that's true, I quit right now. <laughs> um, but what did you use to make sure that she understood you? Google Translate. Hey. <laughs> Man, we got Docs, Translate, <laughs> Reader. You guys, yeah. I don't have much You should just me. move in. I love the Google Pixel. If anybody has now we're just pandering. about <laughs> now we're Google just Pixel 2, I would love to hear it. Me too, Yeah, actually. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? I'm taking up a. Also, Google Fiber. I can't wait for that. Oh my also, God. Also, Google Fiber. 
I'm on the fiber team. We were talking about I this use before. Google domains. Like, I am all over Google. Now she's just trying to get a job. <laughs> we were just talking on the train over. You guys should start Google resumes and let that be the new LinkedIn. Anybody? Anybody? You are giving away all of your good ideas. I know. <laughs> when this thing implodes, like, I want to work here. <laughs> Sorry, Tobin. No, anybody? Well, that, OK. So I'm curious how often people think that you guys have insane technology and actually you're like, well, that's a ways up. <laughs> Probably you can't answer that question. I'm just, it's a curiosity that I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with all of us before we wrap up? About I'm not joking about working here one day. <laughs> OK. We'll easy. stay in touch. <laughs> we'll stay in touch. Um, yeah, anything else you'd like to share about the podcast or about your experience with the podcast? I would just again plug like if anyone has interest in filling out our survey, like we really are just fascinated by people's stories mm -hmm. and want to collect as many as we can and it helps the project be more representative too. Yeah. So uh, nancypodcast.org slash work. Yeah, you'd be sure with your networks. Now I kind of want podcast to be my full time job. That sounds really <laughs> <laughs> Talking about queer things and answering people's pitches for stories. Does anyone have any pitches for stories while we're here? Ooh, live pitch session. Live pitch session happening a, now. I don't think I could do that. No? <laughs> Can you, you pop up to the mic? Sorry. <laughs> oh. Sorry. But look at that bow tie. Or Pennywise from It. And, and Baba Duke. Duke. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. he's no, going to be like Baba Wise, and they're dating, and they like, like they? to wear extravagant clothing, like kill children. Like I thought there's like a whole yeah. thing you could do on this. So here's the thing. I, um, there's, there are so many like gay Twitter things that I would love to do a story about, but it moves so fast. <laughs> like for a second, I was like, we have to do a Park Stenton thing. Like I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Park Stenton. It was like some, uh, fake twink on Twitter catfished a bunch of guys and it like gay Twitter blew up about it and then it like disappeared within a day. Anyway, this is all to say like yes, I am like hungry to do something about it. It's a challenge because it moves so fast, but yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. So yes. We can be quote unquote Baba Shuck. <laughs> it sounded so uncool saying that. <laughs> How long does it usually take you to uh, come up with an idea and then record the podcast and then get it out? What is that timeline? Oh, it depends. So that we know in case we want to pitch any stories, so we know when, when to look for it. It really depends on when we start working on it and then mm -hmm. how we see it fitting into our schedule. Um, like the L Word story started right at the end of the last season because I was on vacation and I started watching it. And then we had to turn it around within like a few weeks. But we've had stuff, like our Orlando episode took like six months, I think, because we went there. And then we did all the recordings, and then we came back, and we had so many hours of tape to work through. We had like 16 hours of tape yeah. when we came back from that. And then that got cut down into a 40-minute episode. Yeah. So that one was like, yeah, like six months yeah. to get that one done? Maybe on average, like six to eight weeks. I'm not sure. Okay. It, it really depends. So not Twitter timeline, then. That's like. It's hard. It's, it's tough. Yeah. There and gone, yeah. Yeah. A huge thank you to you both for coming. A huge thank you to WNYC Studios also for being amazing and bringing these folks in. Huge round of applause. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming.